So thanks for having me today. So a uh, little bit, yeah, a little bit introduction to myself. So I started. So I started my my career actually uh, back back in KPMG. So so back then I was just working in general analytics, and then somehow uh, I, I got a chance to to probably like like many other folks, like maybe the first first time encountering machine learning is through some some very popular MOOCs or or some uh, master course. I also did did that way, and later um, why I I got in touch with. Uh, Kaggle competition. So it's that probably it's like uh it, it 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 kind of feels like to me it's the fastest way to to learn. So um because you will realize like learn learning through through competition is much more efficient than, than learning through 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 textbooks and, and courses because you actually try try out something and you immediately see uh your your results quantified and not only for for that, right? So, um, through this kind of journey, you actually learn how to manage your your time and resource. Just, just like um, just like the su suggestion given by by Rajis, right? If you, if you if you don't have the GPU, um, uh, supported to to build sixteen deep learning model, like you, you somehow need to find another way to achieve kind of the same same task. So, to me, is a, a pretty practical way to to learn in machine learning and AI. So so anyway, so later later on, I I move on kind of to to the, the banking environment. So so as introduced, uh, I'm now working in uh, risk analytics, uh, specialized in in um, money laundering detection. So um, partly analytics, and sometimes you also use uh, machine learning models to, to detect financial crime. But it's kind of a uh, little bit different from, from, general, um, from general machine learning. So it's like our target size is always way less than 1% of the full population. So we, we constantly de dealing with insufficient samples or very, very low, um, very imbalanced data sets. So, um, so Okay, so this is a bit of introduction to myself. Um, so back to this competition. And, and by the way, I didn't have time to make a, a prettier slide. So, uh, so please bear with me uh, for, for these like 15 to half hours. Um, so competition was, was hosted by Optiverse. So, so probably uh, a lot of you uh, heard, heard this name. It's kind of the one, one of the biggest uh, market maker uh, in, in the world. And um, probably that, that was the, the first competition hosted by this company. So um, here's the, the topics that I, I'm going to cover. So uh, I'm going to introduce the competition format. So I will spend a little bit of time explaining the, the data set. And thirdly, I will, I will introduce my overall uh, model landscape uh, or, or the pipeline. And lastly, I will talk about the features I, I built. So I'll put um, yeah, more focus on feature in, in the last session. So there will be uh, some common and basic features and also some of the more, more interesting ones. For example, like using deep learning to, to create features from time series. So, um, so as the title suggests, right, this is, this is a um, volatility prediction competition. So the task was pretty simple. So we were given kind of a standard data source. We have a bunch of uh, US listed stocks and also uh, some kind of time windows. But the time windows is rather narrow. So for each row of data, it's actually representing only a 10 minutes window. And the task for us is to predict the so-called realized volatility. So the formula is put here. So you realize it's actually just the, the standard deviation, right? But you, you, you assume that uh, stocks will have zero mean, so you can drop the mean, and also you drop the scaling factor, you no longer take the average. So this is kind of a simplified version of, of um, volatility. So, um, right, so we have to predict this 10 minutes windows uh, volatility, but, but what is the data used to predict that? 
So um, we will have to use the, the previous 10 minutes. So late, later in, in the next uh, one or two, so I will talk about the data. So basically we will have a, the previous 10 minutes order book data and trade data to do that. And the, the rule is that once we have the, the predicted target, the predicted volatility, so it will be evaluated through uh, root mean squared percentage error. And um, for that competition, so um, similar to, to other typical uh, financial uh, or slash trading competition, normally the way they do that is that they, they will have a period of um, training or, or model development uh, cycle where you can submit um, as many uh, trial as you want. And after that, it will go through another evaluation period. So you, you can no longer submit your, your, your prediction. Um, then the, the platform will actually load the, the real world, the live um, stock data. And yeah, this is kind of a, a live validation. You actually need to wait for three months until you, you see your competition results. So this is the way we, we do this kind of uh, competition. And about the, the scale of the data. So um, we have 112 stocks. And uh, I guess we had like a thousands or more um, such kind of uh, 10 minutes windows. So at the end, we have to, to predict uh, like 115K data points. So let's spend a little bit time to, to explore the data. So um, the, the, the main focus of this competition is actually uh, on the order book data. So um, probably you, you already know, like, like the, you're familiar with the standard, uh, pri the trading and price data where you, you, you have um, a daily volume, the traded price, and also the high low um, close and and yeah open and close right, but here we are dealing with the order book data. So essentially, before you you come up with with a price, uh, actually there there are lots of uh, lots of different investors, the buyers and sellers. So they they are quoting prices at different level, and they. As you see, for example, in this, um, this small table, right? So um, the middle column is the, is the price. And actually you, you have a long list of uh, bid and ask uh, prices. So perhaps uh, the, 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 the price that, that's, that is traded is close to one, 147 and 148. But actually there's a long queue uh, before and, and after that, maybe somebody wanted to trade in 146. Um, so he has to, to wait um, until he, he find the opposite buyer or seller that's willing to, to trade um, at his uh, desired price. So this is why um, in this data set, uh, we don't have just one set of price. We actually have uh, multiple price. If you look at the, the right-hand side, so we have several columns. So bid price one, ask price one, bid price two, ask price two. So the, the so-called one and two, they are actually representing the, the, the most competitive and second competitive price, right? So for example, the bid price one in, in the left-hand side table will be 147, then the then the bid price two will be one, four, six. And it applies the same to, to the ask, uh, ask price. So, so this is why um, the, the order book data is formatted like, like this way. So we have four columns of bid and ask price. We also have four columns for the bid and ask um, size. So, here we can try to relate, try to relate from, from this data set to, to the target we are trying to, to predict. So at the end, we are trying to predict volatility. So how can we do that? So here's a, a simple formula that, that allow us to do that. So we can compute the so-called weighted average price, which is uh, to, to basically take, take into account the size, right? We, 
we multiply the the price and size together, and then and then average through the the total size, and give us the the WAP. So since WAP is kind of a price, so we are able to derive a return based on this series. So a standard way is to to compute the log return, um, as in this formula. Probably a lot of you already know this. And finally, from the log return, we can calculate the the realized volatility using uh, yeah, the formula I introduced at the start. So this is the order book data. So um, it is not the only data set we got. In fact, we, we also have the trade data. Um, trade data is probably uh, the, uh, the most studied data set uh, if you ever touch uh, financial data. So you just have the standard price and size and order count and nothing else. So um, in this competition, so we will focus more on the order book data. So indeed we will build some features around trade, but um, yeah, for, but for learning and knowledge sharing purpose, right? So order book data is, our, is of our key interests. And, and by the way, um, probably I, I forgot to mention. So talking about the, the, the granularity of, of data, right? So we got, uh, remember for, for each target, we are given 10 minutes of um, order book data. So that 10 minutes is actually a, a per second uh, data set. So that means for, for, for each target, we are having a time series of uh, length 600. Um, so, yeah, later on I'll, I'll explain how I use these 600 data points to build some of the time series feature. So up to here, uh, any questions? Uh, excuse me, I, I just wonder, the uh, WAP, why do you uh, shift uh, the, uh, the R's and bit size uh, so uh, my, uh, my my intuition first uh, naive intuition is bid price uh, times uh, the bid size plus um, ask price uh, time ask uh, size. Uh, yeah. So why do you in well I mean interchange both of them? Any reason about that? Yeah, it's actually a, a good catch. Um, to be honest, I I don't have an answer to this. So the the formula was was kind. Uh, given by a tutorial notebook from Optiver itself. <laughs> Actually, I may need to turn the question to say Gautier. Are you familiar with how, how the WAP is, is defined? Uh, I'm not so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I can probably explain the intuition around it. So the so it's inverse because you are expecting the price to go in the opposite way. So if your bid price bid size is higher than the ask size, then you are expecting the price to actually go up. Just like then, hence you are measuring it in this way. Oh, okay. I see. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So this is also kind of the situation that you you don't actually have all the domain knowledge, but you still will, will proceed with the, the competition. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this is a, a, a very good question. Um, okay, let's talk about the, the model. So in terms of the pipe, pi pipeline, it's all explained in this uh, one graph. So. I'll do a bunch of uh, feature engineering. Um, and then I'll split into the three models. So the first one is just grading boost, gradient boosting. So uh, where, where the light GBM will be used. And for the second model, I tried the, the very simple neural net. So basically the, the multi-layer perceptron and Lastly, it is the, the template. So it, it, it was kind of popular back then, I, I guess one or two years ago. So it is basically a transformer model applied into um, tabular data sets. So 
So after building the three models, uh, they will be combined through kind of a, a meta learning or, or blending. So I tried two versions. So one of that was a, a regression, a simple, a simple um, regression model that allows only positive weight. So it's kind of learning the optimal weight between the three models. And the other one I tried is, is a, a random forest model. Um, but at the end, so uh, we're just combining the prediction from, from three models. And at the end, we will got the, the final prediction. Okay. Yeah, just uh, some comments on, on the models, right? So um, you see, com compared to uh, our, our previous presenter, right? So um, here, Actually, for, for each category, I only implemented one, one model. So for gradient boosting, so um, let's highlight some, some uh, pros and cons, right? So obviously, it is very easy to, to train and optimize. And uh, probably you, you, you have experienced that it has very solid performance on tabular data. So more like um, gradient boosting is something you, you, would, you would try by default, more acting like as a a a baseline model right and if if we're going to implement only one version so so preference usually given to the light gbm because of of the speed or if you actually have some categorical data uh, that you don't have the time to pre-process then maybe you can use cat cat boost as well because you don't need that uh that extra cleaning steps and neural networks, so uh, obviously good for large data sets, so especially for, for this one where we, we, we have uh, numerous, so a very huge time series data. But uh, at the same time, so probably not, not true for everybody, but for me, uh, I'm still struggling like how, how I can fine tune a neural network, right? Because some of the, the hyper parameters are kind of preset and it's hard to it's hard to tune once you have the, the first model. For example, how would you determine the, the optimal number of layers, right? And for each layer, how, how, many, how, many, um, how many neurons do you want to have? So, so far, these uh, kind of models, I, I built it uh, using kind of arbitrary um, uh, hyperparameter. Hyper hyper so, yeah, so... This is my overall comment to, to uh, neural, neural networks. And lastly, for the tabnet, right? So as a very quick introduction, so it's the transformer um, for tablet data developed by, by Google in 2019. So um, yeah, so I'm not sure how well it performs in general for, for um, the broader data set. But uh, at least for, for two of my competition, indeed, it is, is providing quite, quite a good result. It's competitive um, against the gradient boosting model. So, um, so with the free model, it is quite uh, beneficial, right? To, to take, kind of take, take an average out of them or some blending uh, optimized weight uh, between the three models because they, uh, in general, they, they're quite different models. They are coming from different types. That's why you can exploit uh, the low correlation between them. So that's why we will have the, the last model. So the, the meta model. So um, probably also explained by, by Rajneesh, right? So um, you don't want to have a meta model. The, the, quick, the quickest way you can do that is to just simply put equal weights. But uh, yeah, if you want to try more, try more, you probably won't want to apply a model. So um, my, my general uh, preference is that I will want to use simpler methods into uh, the, the, the final layer meta model. And um, also one drawback that, that I noticed is that um, if we want to further train model on top of other models, in general, it requires extra validation data. And, that might actually harm your performance, especially um, if you already have very limited data sets, right? If you have 
very limited records, it is hard to, to kind of further split your data into smaller part. For example, if you get only like 5% five, five of data of, uh, to validate your, your meta model, um, would you still trust the, the results, right? Do you believe that um, that final validation can provide a, a stable model? That's something uh, I will concern uh, if I build uh, that kind of uh, meta model. But anyway, this is the, the idea that I, I actually tried in the competition. So, yeah. So this is about the model. Any, any questions? Okay, then I will move on to the features that I built. So let's talk about the, the more basic feature first. So, um, so how, how do we tackle um, this prediction problem? So we, we were given a uh, lot of data. So we, we were given the order book data uh, of 600 seconds, 600 rows. So um, essentially the simplest way is to try to summarize this time series. So you, at the end, you, you will see it's all about summarizing time series in, into a, a single value, a single feature that you can fit into the model. So the simplest way to do that is to, let's say, to predict the future volatility, can you simply use the historical volatility? So that is absolutely a, a valid idea, right? So we can, we can implement that first. And following similar um, concept, we can derive other statistics, for example, um, can we take the, the average of the, of the, of the log return or price? So um, actually I'm jumping through the points. So yeah, actually besides the WAP, log return and volatility, we can also derive other stuff. So um, for example, we can calculate the total volume. So volume is, is probably useful because then we are predicting uh, volatility and um, um, from my understanding, right? So the, the higher the, the, the volume, probably the, the greater the volatility. So um, also we can measure the volume in, in balance. Like uh, you have the, the bit side, the bit side and us side. Would the imbalance between the two side cause a, a greater volatility? So that is also something we, we can test. And uh, lastly, uh, probably this is uh, quite normal to implement. So we have bid and ask price, then we can just calculate the bid ask spread. So through this way, we're actually creating more time series besides the, the original um, like 12 time series. So like then the next step is to, is to think about how, how we can summarize the time series into a, a single feature. So like I said, right? So we, if, we, if we just measure the standard deviation, then of the log return, then it's simply the historical volatility. Um, then using similar concept, we can do a lot of other stuff like um, taking, what about we, we're taking the, the moving average or moving standard deviation of other columns. Um, like it, we can, for example, we can, we can take the, the moving average of the time series and then take the last point as our, our feature. That is one way to do. At the same time, people can also argue, right? Um, when we define average, uh, should it be average of, of the, the whole time series or half of the series or just the last 10 seconds of the series? So you, you actually have infinitely many options to, to, to build features. So one major argument is that maybe the, the more recent data, the, the better. So um, through this concept, we can calculate statistics based on uh, a, a real variance. Let's say I compute the same, the same feature for the last, last 500 seconds and also do the same for the last four, 400 seconds and 300 seconds. So in, in, in this way, you're kind of capturing um, different parts of the same time series. So this is one thing we can do. And also we can do another thing is to detect the change in, in the time series, right? So um, if I have 
six hundred second? Should I care about the, the change between the first three hundred seconds and the last three hundred seconds? So that might also be relevant, right? It's kind of detecting、uh, the general trend or or momentum in the time series. And lastly,、uh, some easy idea that you you could think of. So so far we have been dealing with、um, the the stock and time level features. So in in a particular ten minutes and for a particular stock, you're building some some kind of time series feature. But in fact, you can also do that in in some aggregated level. For example,、um, you you can you can calculate some feature based on the entire stock. Or the entire ten、uh, minutes time window, that can give you kind of different viewpoint to to the problem, right?、Um, for example, if you calculate time level feature, you essentially believing that、um, there's something special about that particular ten minutes that is going to help you、uh, to to predict to to help you predict the next ten minutes volatility. So this is something uh, that uh, we can use to to augment our feature sets. Okay, any question here? Yes, Caleb. So there is a question in the chat from Vincent,、uh, who asks if you look into off-the-shelf libraries for time series features, such as Fits, well, that's in R, but in Python you have TS Fresh or、H. yeah. ETSA, Talib, etc. So apparently there are lots. Is that something you look into? Yeah,、uh, absolutely. So I remember I I look into TS Fresh. So、um, I, I I remember TS Fresh、uh, will automatically compute a very a very large feature set for you. If you just throw throw in one time series, it will output you like one hundred、um, extracted time series feature. So I, I would say it's definitely recommended to 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 try one one of those. Um, um, if you do that, probably your your pipeline later on will you will have to spend more time to carefully select the the features, right? Because you absolutely you you won't have the time to study. Let's say you, it outputs you one hundred feature. But can you truly understand what those one hundred features are, are doing? Probably you you won't have the time. So that means you have to quantitatively、uh, do the feature selection later、uh, within your pipeline. So TA lib、um, is not used here because、uh, I believe TA TA lib is、um, applied to the standard、uh, open high low close data set, which which we don't have here, and、um, Even if you have that kind of data set, probably you 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 want to ask yourself, right? Do do you believe in in TA technical analysis、uh, fundamentally, right? So there are other and another mainstream argument saying that if you if you're doing machine learning or or quant in financial data set, probably you you don't want to、uh, start with the technical and analysis, right? Because Some of them say those those are BS. So,、um, but anyway, these are the the concerns I I will have or consideration I will have if I'm going to use this kind of uh, pre-built uh, libraries. So hopefully, that answers your question. Thank you, thank you, Caleb. Let's、uh, move on. Sure.、Um, Hi,、uh, I have a question. Sure, sure.、Uh, You calculated the statistic based on the last five、uh, hundred seconds. All these statistics is the manual factors, or have you tried to use some uh, individual uh, neural network to learn from it? And、uh, the output of the neural network is regarded as a single factor. Yeah, it's a good question. And short answer to that is that I I didn't. So it's right. So this kind of You see, these are round numbers, right? Five hundred, four hundred. These are arbitrary choice. So,、um, I would say, if if given more time, right, it's really beneficial to do kind of,、uh, kind of have an ad hoc analysis, a a a, a branch analysis, just to study, right, in general, which parts of the time series over over that six hundred second is is most predictive、uh, to the target. 
So in fact, your your question was actually raised by by one of the very um, top performers uh, with, in, in the same competition. He asked that question uh, very early in, in, in the stage. Um, but yeah, um, at, at the end, so so far in, in that competition community, no, no one really uh, provided a, 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 a good answer to this. So so ne neither myself had, had an answer to this. But, but it's a very, very valid question that um, to, to ask, like, um, should we blindly believe that, um, let's say, that the last part of the time series is the most useful one? Or we, we want to uh, systematically find out that the optimal interval. So, yeah, this yeah, is a very yeah. good, good suggestion. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I want to share our experience with you because previously I think that deep learning is extremely powerful in the high frequency data and especially sometimes the high frequency, high frequency treating signals. The truth is that it put in front of you and you cannot understand it because it is very high dimension. So the neural network is very good at this thing. But, uh, uh, and uh, if we use it to solve the very high fre frequency point, such as 0 0.5 seconds, it uh, will have a very high precession, but uh, bear with the dimension disaster uh, and also the storage uh, disaster. But if we smooth it, let each data point to be several seconds, it will be uh, lower precision, lower accuracy, but a higher return. So this is the thing I want to balance. Uh, so maybe we can share some opinions with this, with this thing later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, other yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, the next talk uh, from Patrick uh, will be uh, heavy on deep learning. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, let's let's see for the next talk. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll move on. Um, so coming to the last part, I, I want to highlight like like two of the the ideas. So I want to focus on the ideas, but, but not the the ultimate performance. So, so so far, those features that, that we built um, in the in the previous slide, th those are very common features like everybody could, could thought of. So, but to do better, like imagine you, you want to beat all those com comp competitors that use similar features. You you need to think of something that, that they didn't think of. So that's the point that I started to to think of like how can I extract features from, from time series in a different angle? So compared to the previous one, right? Um, even essentially, we are, we, we are, let's say, taking average. So uh, it's, a, it, it's a very, a, a predefined, it's basically a predefined formula, right? So we, we have the time series, we take all the data points and then we, we use some kind of formula to, to calculate the, the feature. But what if I, I want to extract feature based on simply the, the shape itself, the time series has, has a certain pattern and shape, right? What if I just want to extract information based on the pattern? So uh, this is the, at the point that I started to, to look into uh, auto encoder. So um, probably a lot of you are familiar with auto encoders, right? So if, if we just, okay, yeah. Um, in classical deep learning, right? So an auto, get, auto encoder looks like this. So you have a, a larger input uh, array features, then you, you you gradually shrink into um, the smaller the smaller sequence. So then you will have at the middle the the, the, en the encoded version of your of your feature, and and then you 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 augment it again. So at the end, your output should be should be the same as your input. So that means if your if your encoding is doing is doing good, your your predicted output should be very similar to, to your input. So this concept uh, can also be applied into time series. So uh, in particular, this is a, an LSTM implementation. So um, 
the architecture will be like this. So, but you can see this example is actually from, from a language model, but it doesn't matter because you can just, we are simply replacing the, the language model with a, with a time series because at the end, they are, all, they are all sequence of data, right? So it's just, so how you do it is you take the, the input and perhaps the, the, your, your input has, um, has like, for example, I started with like 16 uh, features, 16 time series. Then gradually I can shrink the number of features in, instead of this is kind of like an analog to the shrink in, in, in the MLP. So I just shrink the number of columns, maybe from 16 to eight to, to four. Then I determine that four is the, the dimension that I want to extract from the time series. Then I stop at four. So uh, for that, for after that step, what we can do is to extract the last value of those time series. And then we will do one step, it's to, which is to repeat the vector. We repeat the same value um, back to the full sequence. So, um, so it, it is up, we are talking about these steps. We take the last value and then apply to the full sequence again. Then we expand the, the series again from the less number of features to, to more features. So this is the way we, we we construct the auto encoder. So when implemented into uh, this commutation, so uh, this is the, the parameter table I have uh, for the for the right hand side figure. So yeah, so um, let's talk about some some um, drawbacks, right? So in fact, this is exa exactly the point that. Um, that I was just asked about downsampling. So um, if we do this using a, a 600 length time series, uh, at the end, just simply using Kaggle kernel, it, it won't work. We won't have the time and resource to, to do all the computation. So uh, at the end, I needed to downsample um, to, to bring it down to a lower resolution. Right? So I, I did a, a 10 to one sampling. So uh, basically it's, Taking average every every ten seconds, then through this way I I can manage the the training time. So this is kind of a a, a drawback of this solution. So let's see the results. Right, um, this is essentially an experimentation. I've never done this before, but surprisingly, this LSTM auto encoder can really uh, reconstruct some some of the time series, so it's not doing uh, exception exceptionally well. So especially for for those uh, very com complicated shapes, but looks like it at least can can capture some some simple patterns or or trends, right? If you look at, for example, this one, it's doing good. Um, but if we look at the the complicated ones, uh, let's say this one, probably you can only Cap capture the, the long term trend, kind of like capturing the, the, the moving average, but cannot capture, uh, but it cannot re reconstruct, reconstruct um, the, the very granular level of pattern. So uh, this, is in, this is interesting. Um, so this is the, the visual results, right? So at the end, how we can, we can leverage this back to our prediction. Is that we, we can take the the encoded part. For example, if, if I set the, the the dimension to four, then what I get from from this LSTM model is that I, I get a an extra four feature, and actually that's it. So um, probably we we like all types of auto encoder, right? Because it is encoded, we actually uh, we won't be able to interpret the the, the meaning of those um, features. They are essentially the compressed version of the of the time series, and the main benefit of this is to is to provide uh, extra features that are less correlated from from uh, with the previous common features, and that should add benefit to the final prediction. Um, any question here? 
Nope. If not, then yeah. Hello. No, I don't think anyone has questions. Okay, so let's quickly go through the, the last idea that I tried. So again, coming from the same same angle question. So uh, how can we extract feature based on the shape of the of the time series itself? So so I thought of an idea to to cluster the time series. So can we look at just the shape of the time series and determine what group it should belong to? So it leads to, to this idea. So uh, it is a time series clustering based on a, a special uh, similarity metric called DTW, dynamic time time warping. You know, microphone. You can quick time pair. Uh, oh, okay. awesome. See you, CZ. Maybe somebody should, should build himself. Yes, someone needs to be muted. Yeah, sorry about that. I just muted that person. Oh, okay. No, no worries. So, right. So, um, let's talk about the, the, the main benefit, right? Why do we have to, to choose a, a special metric in, in term, um, instead of the, the usual way we, we do? Um, because when you just look at a uh, two sequence of number, how, how would you measure the similarity? The most straightforward way is to use a, a Euclidean um, distance, right? So this is the, the, the probably the most straightforward solution. But um, you will see visually, uh, let's say from, from this uh, right-hand side graph, right? um, maybe because of uh, some shift in, in patterns. For example, you, you get a maximum around here, but in the other series, you get the max the, the maximum around here. So the location of, of, of the similar pattern actually doesn't match. So if you simply plug in Euclidean uh, matching, you will get a very uh, low similarity score. So DTW is used to, to specifically solve this problem because it allows you to match data points um, to basically it, it matches one sequence data point to another one without fixing uh, the, the, the index. For example, um, starting from the blue one, it, it determines that the optimal match is the, maybe from index zero, it, it is actually matched with index three, for example. So, um, so if we continue this exercise, we will get this kind of um, kind of a, a nonlinear mapping of uh, between the, the indexes. So um, so probably this algorithm algorithm itself is uh, could could be a larger topic, but I'll just highlight uh, the pros and cons. So the good thing obviously is to to capture similarity similarity uh, based on shift shifted patterns. This is the, the most important aspect. But the cons is that um, it's quite an expensive algorithm. So in fact, it, it is running in, in uh, the, the square time. So the N is the length of the, the sequence. So again, probably some down sampling is, is required before directly applying. Okay. So lastly, again, I'll, I'll just show the results. So, um, Probably this one, I, I think it, it didn't um, do um, as good as I expected. So um, I look at some, some of the tutorials and, and examples I, I found online, right? So, so there were good results, um, but very soon I, I, I realized that why, why I'm getting a very different result. Probably it's due to the fact that um, uh, in financial time series, we are actually dealing with really many different types of times time series. So um, here I'm doing a k-means clustering using DTW uh, distance metric, and I just only I have just set a, a the number of cluster to be seven, and I'm getting the result below. So um, so you will see that the red line is the so-called uh, average line, but the average will, will be will have a very different definition uh, as, as you as you experience in, in the normal k-means clustering. So this, I think, the official term for this red line is the the Barry center. 
So it's basically the the line that minimizes the the DTW um, uh, against all those great lines be behind. Basically, it's a kind of um, uh, reconstructing the concept of of the centroid of of a cluster. But, but anyway, it is the centroid of the cluster. So um, um, I I guess what, what I observed here is that it can it can group uh, simpler patterns again. So probably for for the last two one, to me they they are making sense, right? So more more like we we are really seeing um, uh, a down uh, an upper trend. In, for example, this one, an upward trend at the beginning and a downward trend uh, at, at the end. But uh, for the other groups, I probably my comment is that um, perhaps in we are dealing with just too many types of uh, time series that just simply seven cluster could not could not handle. So the rest of uh, so the granularity is not enough to capture all the patterns. So probably the the lessons learned here. Uh, is that um, so? Either I have to increase the number of cluster, or um, actually, if I just care about the clustering of time series, actually maybe I should just take the extracted features from that from the previous LSTM encoder, right? And then I actually can perform the usual k-means algorithm. So yeah, these are my ideas and lessons learned and my observations. So. That pretty much concludes my 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 hi, hi. competition. Hey, how are Hello? you? So I forgot to attend the session. Oh no! Please remind me next time. It's Josh now. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, yeah, that's the the end of my my presentation. So any final questions?